were well known and the attack was obviously deliberate, I consider it uh, this cold-blooded murder of American sailors that day. Yet Israel insists it was a tragic case of mistaken identity. It's a very embarrassing for, for a military force like the Israeli Defense Forces to make such a blunder, no doubt. But we admit our mistake. That does not mean that there was any intention or any conspiracy or anything of the sort. The men of the Liberty claim there was a conspiracy and that it's been covered up for 35 years. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. Welcome to Freedom Forum. On this, the seventh day of the sixth month of the year of our Lord Jesus the Christ, 2006. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your indulgence tonight. Give us the strength to get the truth out to the American people so they will understand what's been going on in this country for a long time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight I have as my special guests Gary Brummett in the center here of this uh, crew and on our right, far right, Ken Goche, who are survivors of the ill-fated USS Liberty that was attacked by Israeli jet aircraft and torpedo boats on June 8, 1967. The clip that you saw the opening for from the tape dead in the water is a, a very interesting and very detailed examination of this incident and we're going to intersperse between comments tonight clips from that tape. Tomorrow night our meeting at uh, Southside Bakery we will show the entire program for you and uh, encourage anybody that can make it to get out there tomorrow night 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Southside Bakery. All right, I want to uh, go ahead and thank you gentlemen, Gary and Ken, for coming on the show tonight and ask Gary to start things off. Well, first off, as always, uh, this is my second visit with Tom in the Freedom Forum here in Lafayette, Louisiana. I want to thank Tom for having us. Uh, I think that it's important anytime, any place that we can tell our story of what happened, what has been covered up, that it's very important. I think the American people need to know about this. Even though tomorrow will be our 39th anniversary uh, to what happened, it's still just as relevant today what is going on in the Middle East as it was then. And I, I think that we took the wrong path 39 years ago, and I think we need to change this. The uh, last time we saw Gary and Ken was a year ago, almost to the day. And at that time they had some plans to take further steps to advance the cause of truth and justice. And I'd like Gary to go over quickly what they had done with regard to filing of war crimes charges. Well, the war crimes report was put together by an attorney out in California, a gentleman by the name of Ron Gotcher. Um, Joe Matters, who is a fellow crew member from Corpus Christi, found the place in the Department of Defense regulations that stated, you know, that we could actually file a war crimes report. All these years we didn't know we could do this. Well, the war crimes report was written up. We filed it with the Secretary of Defense and his designate is the Secretary of the Army, is who is to investigate all war crimes. It doesn't say that they may or they might investigate war crimes. It says they shall when war crimes has been committed. Uh, the document that we filed 38 years to the date with the, uh, at the Pentagon in numerous places showed that there had been war crimes committed against American service personnel. Uh, also, we did have uh, three civilians on the ship, one of which was killed during the attack. Um, this war crimes report has now languished for nearly a year. 
will be a year tomorrow. Um, the Secretary of Defense handed it off to JAG, JAG the NCIS, NCIS bumped it to what they called a command authority. When we asked what is command authority, we were told that was the White House. Then it was brought back down the chain of command. And recently, uh, approximately two weeks ago, uh, Admiral Merlin Starring, who is a retired JAG officer out of the Navy, uh, who has carried this, uh, done the legal work for us in Washington since this past July, uh, received a letter from the Secretary of Army's office that they had no intention of investigating this war crimes report. It's as if the rule of law does not apply to the crew of the USS Liberty. For our viewers, uh, would each of you tell them what your job was on the ship and uh, a little bit about what happened to you that day? You want to start, Ken? Sure, I'll be glad to start. My job on the ship, I was a communications technician, and my job was to uh, record uh, facsimile type transmissions on certain frequencies throughout the day at different times. Myself, now I was a third class BT. I was in engineering. Um, our main job was to get the ship where it had to go so people like Ken uh, could do the research that they done, which I think uh, was signal intelligence or signet as it's referred to. Okay. That day, do you have any uh, recollections of the actual event that you'd like to share with the folks? This, this was a, a surprise attack, folks. These these guys were a peaceful ship. They were doing electronic intelligence work. They were virtually unarmed. I, I would like to get Ken, if he does not mind telling the story of what happened to him, because if this won't move you a little bit, something's wrong with you. They need to take you to the graveyard, I guess. It's kind of hard to forget uh, John I mean, tight experience that you received, even though it was 30-something years ago. Uh, the morning of the Liberty, I was outside, standing on the side of the deck, uh, smoking cigarettes. Uh, I guess my mother's will, of course, but I felt I was old enough. And uh, I noticed the smoke coming from the horizon and wished there was an announcement on the ship saying that was from the Israel War and there was something burning over there. And it was pretty far away, we could barely see the smoke. And about that time, uh, we had noticed early in the day there had been small flights of airplanes flying over us. I would call it a, a Piper Cub type airplane. I mean, I don't know airplanes, but I'd say something like a Cessna 172 or something like that. They would, had flown by several times in the morning. And all of a sudden, there was a loud, loud explosion. And I turned around and looked toward the back end of the ship. Uh, at least I think it was the back end of the ship. I can't remember. And there was a jet. A jet just going straight up in the sky and of course what happened was, was the surface the air missile was shot into the ship at this particular time general quarters were sounded and everybody was skirmishing to the general quarters location which mine was inside the ship in the communication department where the uh where we were doing signet in uh, at which time we were down there all the doors were locked the water integrity was put on the ship which means if something got to the ship, there's no water that goes through one door area to another area. While we were down there, which was several minutes or maybe an hour or so, I can't really remember the time, we could hear explosions on the ship above and, and gunfire. And, of course, there was an announcement saying that uh, the aircraft were attacking the ship. There was air-to-surface missiles. There was uh, uh, gunfire going on, uh, napalm dropped on the side of the ship, it was on fire, you could just hear all kind of things. And of course we were locked in below and there was nothing we could do. And after a certain period of time, uh, there was an announcement to stand by for a torpedo attack at which everybody was instructed to find a safe place in the, in the quarters that you were in and, and lay down and just get out of the way or whatever. In which uh, I laid down on the side and there was a large safe behind me uh, which had uh, top secret information in. And I turned around, I looked at that safe, and I thought, well, if that safe would happen to blow down, I was surely going to get squashed. So what I did was is I, I decided to, uh, to, to move over in case the safe didn't, in fact, fall. Well, it wasn't long after that that there was a, a strong explosion, and, of course, there was smoke and fire 
and immediately there was water up to our, up to our noses. I mean, we were floating in water. Um, and what do you do in a situation like that? I scrambled to get out, uh, tried to go around one bulkhead, and it was all smashed and, and broken, and you couldn't go out that way, and tried to get out the other way, and they were screaming and hollering, and, and of course, I didn't know what was going on, except that I was just fighting for my life. The only problem was, when I did finally make it to the stairway, we were sealed in, and there was no way we could get out of there, and we had about two inches of air uh, to, to, to breathe because we were on the top of the level of the ship that we were, what we were in. Uh, after a certain period of time, we started to remember how long it was. Of course, it's, it really felt like an eternity, but I doubt that it was. Just probably 30 minutes or so. Uh, uh, the, the doors were open, and we were far, finally able to get out of the ship and, and come out above, at which time uh, we later found out that there were 37 guys uh, killed on the ship and 31 of them, uh, uh, 30 or 31 of them was in the compartment that we were in. I was very fortunate to be here and very fortunate to be alive. And it was very traumatic because you don't forget something like that for the rest of your life. Thank you, Ken. Very <coughs> <awesome. coughs> Well, it's kind of hard to talk behind what Ken just told, but I was in engineering. Uh, the area I was in was probably 12, 15 feet below the water level. Uh, we heard one of the standby for torpedo attack. Uh, of course, I guess I should back up to the very start of it, as, as Ken did. <clears throat> Prior to the attack, the captain came on the ship's 1MC, the, P, uh, the ship's PA system, and announced uh, hostilities on the beach, 12.5, 13 nautical miles, something like that. And I can remember going up topside, and you could see columns of black smoke, and you could see the very top of a minaret there at Elorish and, and the Sinai. Uh, after that, I was a rep uh, was a repair petty officer in B Division. We went back to the hole. We had a boiler we were going to work on. It uh, was only down about five minutes when the first surface air missile hit the ship. And um, my first reaction was I got up, and looked at uh, up in the uptakes, I thought a steam line had blown up because of the way the ship shook and, and the noise. Uh, but just moments thereafter, I could smell what seemed like gunpowder burning, and I knew that someone had fired on us. Uh, at that point, everybody went to the GQ station. Uh, after we secured portholes, hatches, what have you, uh, established a watertight integrity that we could, we... Uh, Went back to the mess decks where a triage had been set up for the wounded, and they were coming in, and that was a rather frightening place, needless to say, with the screaming and the wounded, what have you. I, at this point, went back to the fire room area and stayed there till throughout the attack, but when the torpedo attack, when that word came, uh, we had been uh, in spaces down there. It was smoke-filled. You couldn't see. Uh, we had rags uh, holding them up, breathing through the rags to, because there was so much smoke. Um, we got the word for standby for torpedo attack starboard side. The first one missed. And then just a few minutes later, we got the same word back down again, standby for torpedo starboard side, standby to abandon ship. And we were hit, uh, and I think Ken would probably agree with me on this, to me, where I was at, it was like the ship was lifted up, and I thought it was going to capsize to port. And then the ship sat back down momentarily for an even keel. And then uh, we listed about 12 degrees to starboard. Uh, at that point in time, we were dead in the water. We had stopped moving. Uh, I could go on with that. but okay. I'd like to add something, too, because I always talk about the safe in, in the room I was in. Several days later, when we did get to port, uh, we had to go back down in the room to, to uh, help pick up the bodies that was left in there in the course of it. And I did notice that the safe had fallen over, and had I not moved, I probably would have gotten smushed that day. I was very okay. fortunate. Now we're going to show you another clip from Dead in the Water that will describe the attack it was in up. Uh, fairly good detail. This is the best video that I have seen on this. There's several that have played on the conventional cable channels, but none as good as this one from uh, the general aspects of what actually happened and the follow-up, the cover-up, and the aftermath. Let's go ahead and, and watch this. It was an unarmed ship. 
designed to listen in on electronic communications and pass intelligence on to the highest levels of the U.S. government. This was 12 minutes. There was no other ship like her. Her no, decks right bristled with 45 antennas, and below were dozens of communications analysts and translators. If it was broadcast on a radio wave, we could receive it at any frequency, low frequency, high frequency, medium frequency, very low frequency. If it was out there, we could receive it. If we were listening and we, we heard a signal and when we looked at it, we couldn't understand it, it was encrypted as well, we'd send it back to NSA and let them hit it with their computers. NSA, the National Security Agency, is America's top secret organization for handling electronic intelligence. From its headquarters outside Washington, it controlled the Liberty as she cruised slowly along the west coast of Africa. In May 67, NASA moved thousands of Egyptian troops into the previously demilitarized Sinai Peninsula. Israel and Egypt now confronted each other head on. Though the saber rattling didn't mean war was inevitable. Then Nasser raised the stakes. He closed the Straits of Tehran, cutting off the Israeli port of Elat. Israel saw this as an act of war and began to mobilize. In fact, Hawks and the Israeli government had been waiting for a showdown with the Arabs. Both sides now prepared for war. Soon to be caught up in this, was the USS Liberty. Her commander, William L. McGonagall, had been in the Navy since World War II. The crew included highly trained code breakers and radio experts, like Dave Lewis. I was the research officer on the research ship. The commanding officer drove the ship. The executive officer was his assistant and I was in charge of, of the 195 security group personnel. We were sent around the world wherever there might be a hot spot to see if we could determine what was going on and if uh, the United States desired any intervention of any sort. Life aboard the USS Liberty was like no other naval life. And in the 1960s, ships of that ilk operated independently. The commanding officer of the USS America, which was the flagship of the Sixth Fleet, didn't keep track of a ship that was sailing um, all by itself. Um, when we were all the Arab-Israeli situation was getting more and more hostile. Uh, that so far there was no war, uh, but it looked to anybody who read the newspapers that there would soon be a war and so we were sent out there obviously to listen to what was going on. Early on the morning of Monday the 5th of June, Israel went to war. Its planes pounded airfields in Sinai and the Suez Canal zone. Meanwhile the Soviet Union was boosting its military presence near the war zone. It moved 20 warships into the eastern Mediterranean. In response, the Pentagon ordered the 6th Fleet to keep all aircraft and ships at least 100 miles away from the coast. But one vessel received no such message. The USS Liberty steamed on towards the Sinai coast. We were told there was no need to worry. We had asked Commander 6th Fleet for a, an armed guard to go along with us, a destroyer, he sent the message back saying we were in, in international waters flying the American ensign. There was no need for an armed escort. The Liberty was approaching a scene of total Israeli victory. On the third day of the war, they'd taken the West Bank. But the big prize was the capture of Jerusalem's old city. I was elated when I heard it. Jerusalem, every Jew prays, I think, every day next year in Jerusalem. That evening, the Liberty arrived at her destination off the Sinai coast.
Thursday, the 8th of June, dawned fine and clear. But the war was still raging, and Israeli planes flew out from the Sinai Peninsula to check on the liberty. Reveille was at six. Um, you got up, you showered and everything, and, and you go uh, for uh, a chow. But before that, we had heard that, like, at five in the morning, or around that time, that the planes were buzzing us. The Israeli aircraft seemed to be identifying the ship as belonging to their ally, America. There were about nine different occasions that airplanes came out, and probably 12 times that were circled, 12 separate orbits of the, of the ship during the morning. Lloyd Painter relieved Ennis as officer of the deck. He too was reassured by the presence of the Israeli planes. I remember vividly looking out through the portholes, looking down on the O-1 level, and seeing all the officers sunbathing. And at the same time, we were being overflown, and I remember feeling very good and very warm inside that we were safe. They knew who we were. We were not a stranger out there that day. Confident that the Israelis knew who they were, the Liberty men relaxed. A new flag was flying, visibility was perfect, and they'd received no orders to leave the area. That sense of security was about to be brutally shattered. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the officers on the bridge spotted three Delta Wing Mirage jets. I saw them come at us. In fact, I was looking through the porthole when the jets came down at, 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 and leveled off on us at attack attitude. To my surprise, uh, there were red flashes under the wings and uh, missiles, rockets started hitting the ship. But the portholes were blown out instantly. Mine and my chest, the fellow next to me uh, got it in his face. And we, we all went down on the, on the deck with the force of the concussion from the uh, glass. The next thing I heard down in my space was a panicky announcement on the loudspeaker 1MC. General Quarters, General Quarters, this is no drill. General Quarters, ship is under attack. And you hear ping, 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 ping. The decks above were being shredded. The attempts to send an SOS message failed. The Liberty's frequencies were being jammed. This message failed. The Liberty's frequencies were being jammed. You'd have to know what frequencies we were going to come up on. Um, to know that, you'd have to know that we were an American ship. If you knew we were an American ship, you knew what frequencies we were going to be on because you knew what the fleet frequencies were. To know that, you'd have to know that we were an American ship. If you knew we were an American ship, you knew what frequencies we were going to be on because you knew what the fleet frequencies were. Duh! Hello! The attackers knew their target, but they were keeping their own identity well hidden. During the attack, uh, no one saw any markings, and some of the men uh, have told me later that they made a special effort to identify them. And they swear that there were no markings, that these airplanes were unmarked. They took out all of our transmitting antennas and shortly thereafter deposited napalm on the deck. It appeared to me that it was the intent of the at attacker to take out all communications and keep pe all people off deck so they couldn't reestablish any sort of antennas or communication system. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. The only reason we got the SOS out was because my crazy troops were climbing the antenna string and long wires while they were being shot at. All right. The attack, as you will see in future clips, and we'll discuss further, was... Apparently premeditated. You heard the one point. there. Eight men were dead. One of the officers the saying that the frequencies were jammed. And Gary's got some good but thoughts I, about that, Gary. Yeah, no, but, okay. Well, I'm repeating the thoughts of Admiral Thomas Moore, I guess, was the first person I ever heard mention it. Was 
if Israel thought that the liberty was the El Qasar, an Egyptian vessel, why were they jamming U.S. naval frequencies? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I would have to assume that our frequencies on an Egyptian horse carrier would not be the same. Plus, the El Qasar was, uh, was a ship that was sitting in Anchorage uh, there in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. Had been there for some years. It was uh, waiting to be scrapped. What about the communications in general after the hit? Did it appear that the attack, as they, they showed on this tape, did it appear to you guys that the, the attack was uh, initially aimed at cutting off your communications? I would have to say yes to that because, and, and I'm talking behind the CTs and some of the people in research and the ETs, the radio men, um, our frequencies were all being jammed. Um, our window to the world for us, our window was our communications out to the Sixth Fleet, because since we were operating independently of everyone, um, all the frequencies were being jammed. There was no way to get the SOS out. Uh, Dave Lewis mentions in the Dead in the Water tape about his guys running long wires uh, to get a uh, tower back up and running that had been down, which uh, it could not have been jammed for the simple fact that it was off the air. So that I assume would not have been putting out a signal. Uh, perhaps Ken could elaborate on that a little bit since he was a CT and perhaps knows a bit more. Unfortunately, I was never involved in any of that type of communications and as far as me having any kind of knowledge of anything as far as them jamming our, our signals. Uh, I was unaware of this until after the whole incident was over. Okay. Sorry, I can't help you with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, we've got a state-of-the-art U.S., for a lack of a better term, spy ship here. Was right. the Liberty. Was there anybody in the world that had anything better in electronic communications than, than the Liberty was equipped with, you think, in the world? I'm not aware of any. Not to my knowledge, the Soviets would have been way behind us. They probably would have been the closest to us, but okay. no, no one. So the Israelis jammed your frequencies, the best possible uh, radio equipment, communications equipment, available at the time was jammed by the Israelis. It, it sounds to me like they probably knew ahead of time what your frequencies were. All the frequencies were emergency frequencies, etc., that y'all would have been using. And they took uh, great pains to be sure an SOS could not get out under normal circumstances. That is certainly how it appears. Um, I can't draw any other conclusion than that, that they had to know who we were, the frequencies that we used. I, I wish that I could speak knowledgeably about uh, that, but that was not in my field of yeah. training or endeavor. Well, circumstantial evidence has convicted murderers in the past. So, all right, uh, is the next one ready yet? Okay. This next clip is on the actual response to the attack, which uh, Gary and Ken are very much familiar with, and we'll talk about it in depth when we come back. Let's go ahead with that clip. The napalm on the deck appeared to me that it was the intent of the attacker to take out all communications and keep pe all people off deck so they couldn't reestablish any sort of antennas or communication system. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. The only reason we got the SOS out is because my crazy troops were climbing the antenna string and long wires while they were being shot at. At the end of the air attack, eight men were dead and 75 injured. But the worst was yet to come. We immediately uh, cast off our lines and rushed out. I at least didn't know why. The sea was very calm and then a bright day. I think it was around midday, or maybe a little before that, but around midday. Uh, and only on, on the way we were told there was uh, an uh, unknown vessel uh, 
to the south of us or south uh, west of us and uh, we sped over over in that direction very soon we did see a ship a, clearly a naval vessel the last thing i remember is the captain on the intercom system saying stand by for a torpedo attack starboard side down below the waterline the men in the engine room got ready to die torpedoes coming in it's going to open that boiler up and you're going to die instantly it's going to be like an atomic bomb because that cold water when that cold water hits that boiler it's operating at full uh, there's just no hope so all of us 19 year olds the best place to be is right there you're going to get it you're going to give it up right then and there so torpedo I tell you, we waited and they said it went by and this went on like three different times four different times the torpedo is simply dropped into the water. You lose sight of it for a minute. And then you see the wake. And it was going straight for the ship, and we were sure that uh, our torpedo was the one that hit. It hit. And it lifted the ship right out of the water and put it down, and we started to list 10 degrees. Um, but it was a slow list, and it was going, going, going. And I said, my God, we're going to flip over. I was one of the fortunate ones. A temporary bulkhead wrapped itself around me, and the heat of the torpedo exploded all of the paint onto my skin. So I was black, but it was all superficial. I lost both eardrums, got my eyes burnt a little, but I survived. And almost all of the troops within 20 feet of me were killed instantly. We, uh, we just went back to work and uh, prayed that uh, this thing was not going to flip over or was going to go down and, uh, and, and it didn't. Yep. Paralyzed, her power and steering control lost. But her desperate SOS message had been picked up by the American 6th Fleet, 500 miles away off Crete. Retaliation was ordered for the attack. On the USS America, two bombers were readied while their fighter escort was launched. Those aircraft were, were brought forward, and I believe they were launched before we went into Condition November. Condition November meant that nuclear-armed A-4 bombers were to be used. Incredibly, the U.S. was about to launch a nuclear strike against Egypt. The U.S. Embassy was told that an attack was coming. Richard Parker was the political consul. There was this message that they, the Navy was uh, preparing to retaliate against Egypt for the attack on the Liberty. Uh, they thought that it was the, the, the Egyptians who attacked it. They were preparing to, uh, to attack Egypt in response. A few minutes later, Tony Hart passed a Pentagon message through to the Navy. Recall the aircraft. My, my first thought was, as well, we don't want to do mushroom clouds. Uh, the recall probably is to rearm the aircraft. About ten minutes later, the USS America and Washington were connected by voice link. The Defense Secretary himself came on the line. McNamara directed Com 6 Fleet to recall the aircraft. And Com 6 Fleet said, are you sure? And he said, absolutely certain, recall the aircraft. The attack on the Liberty had triggered an extraordinary response. Nuclear armed planes had been on their way to Cairo. A nuclear strike had been minutes away and had only just been averted. But it seems McNamara was also unwilling to send aircraft directly to help the Liberty. The fleet commander asked for permission to send a rescue flight of conventionally armed aircraft. The Admiral was talking to McNamara and asking for permission to relaunch the ready aircraft, relaunch any aircraft. And McNamara said no, that no aircraft were to be launched McNamara is the boss, you know. He doesn't have to explain why he says what he says.
Dave Lewis heard from another officer about McNamara's dealings with the Sixth Fleet. I'm Admiral Larry Geis, the commander of Task Force 60. He was very upset. He said, told me he knew it was going to be hushed up, and I wasn't to say anything about it, but he had to get it off his chest. That he had sent aircraft and notified Washington, obviously via the Criticom network, because it got to Bob McNamara and Lyndon Johnson, and he got, had the aircraft recalled by Robert McNamara. He said he reconfigured a flight of aircraft with aircraft incapable of carrying nuclear weaponry and relaunched it. He again notified Washington. Again, Robert McNamara ordered the aircraft recalled. He challenged the order, and Lyndon Johnson came on. He said he didn't give a damn if the ship sunk. He would not embarrass his allies. A damn if the ship sunk. He would not embarrass his allies. Robert McNamara has never fully discussed his role in the Liberty controversy. You recalled planes sent to rescue the Liberty. I'm absolutely sir. certain that's false. You didn't send a signal to the Sixth absolutely Fleet? Absolutely not. I don't know what the hell happened, and I haven't taken time to find out. But there are all of these claims that we sent planes, the planes were going out and we turned them around, and that we intentionally allowed the Israelis to sink the Liberty. I, I know nothing about it. While the Sixth Fleet was launching and recalling its aircraft, the Liberty was still under attack by the Israeli torpedo boats. You could see these uh, machine gun bullets going through and, and uh, ricocheting off all the metal that was down there. And it actually, some were going into the boiler. They're trying to explode the boiler, and uh, they, they knew what they were doing. We basically were dead in the water. The word came down, prepare to abandon ship. That meant prepare only, go up and get, get ready, get near the life rest. Well, I went up first, popped the hatch, looked out for the life rest. They were either gone or burning. And at the same moment, I looked to the stern of the ship, and I saw one of the torpedo boats methodically machine gunning one of our life rafts that had floated back. We cut the life rafts loose because they were burning or had, had been damaged. And they floated back behind us, and he was machine gunning the life raft. And I knew that had there been anyone in there, they certainly wouldn't be alive. Behind us, and he was machine gunning the life raft. And I knew that had there been anyone in there, they certainly wouldn't be alive. It happened so fast, it didn't seem real. None of the attacks seemed real to me. I was bewildered. I couldn't understand why they would do it to us. I, I just didn't understand a thing at that point. These guys didn't die for anything, they just died. They were slaughtered for nothing. Several points. The launching of the strike aircraft. Let's go over that. I think the, the tape was a little weak there on the sequence of events, perhaps intentionally. From the, especially from the standpoint of the people that were in charge back then, McNamara, etc., was definitely vague about that. And as your comments to me were from so before, McNamara has always talked about all the events in his life with great detail, but is brain dead about the liberty. And that seems odd. Well, it seems odd to me too, especially his comments about, well, I haven't taken the time. Uh, makes you wonder about his uh, love of humanity, doesn't it? Or maybe he doesn't love humanity, he just loves his elite status. But let's go over the, the sequence of events again of the response aircraft. Well, I think that after about, I think it was nine minutes was the time frame in getting the first message out and the aircraft carrier, the Saratoga, radio man on board, picked it up. And Captain Joe Tully, who was a skipper on the Saratoga, had launched aircraft to our aid and defense. Now, these aircraft were recalled for whatever reason. The, the ready aircraft, as the dead and water tape talks about, uh, ready aircraft, my understanding is they're nuclear armed. Um, 
that opens up a whole new can of worms. Um, could this be part of the this Operation Cyanide, something that we talk about? Uh, something that we don't know all the facts in regard to that. Um, these planes were recalled while we were still under attack. And what is so sad to me, and like I said earlier, tomorrow will be 39 years since this happened. We had nine men killed on deck, I think was the correct figure on that. And we had 25 killed in CT spaces. Uh, had those aircraft been allowed to proceed to our aid, they were about 15 or so minutes flying time. They would have gotten there prior to the torpedo boats and the torpedo launch. All these young men that died needlessly that day would still be alive or would have had the opportunity to, like myself and Ken, live a little bit longer. Uh, okay. The first strike, apparently from the tape, and do you all have any other recollection of it from learning later about the details that they were nuclear armed? Well, that has been told a number of times. Um, again, I, anything I would say would really kind of be hearsay, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. in that regard. I know that <clears throat> supposedly one bunch of these planes, let's just say there was one that was nuclear armed. I can see the reason for the recall but I cannot see the reason for the recall on the conventionally armed planes that would have simply been there for our defense right. to come to our aid. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you leave Americans under attack and the attacker go unpunished or at least driven away? Um, the Liberty though is uh, we the ship that just we can't seem to find a safe, a safe harbor. Uh, okay, Let, let's put this in a little perspective for the folks too. The Liberty would be classified as a strategic rather than a tactical ship since it was engaged in uh, intelligence operations at the highest levels. A lot of the information was transferred, uh, sent directly to Washington to either the NSA or the President's office or both probably. And as such, certain uh, criteria are utilized when they're under attack such as, okay, this is a strategic attack. This could be the beginning of an all-out war, including nuclear. So we launch nuclear armed planes, but they're going to be escorted by conventionally armed planes. What is apparent here is all of the planes were recalled, including the conventionally armed planes, on two occasions. Not just the first time when the ready aircraft, which apparently were nuclear armed, were launched. Then the conventionally armed planes, some of them could have escorted the new planes over to Greece, which is I understand they were not recalled back to the aircraft carrier because of the danger of landing with a nuclear device on the aircraft carrier. Instead went to Greece. Well, some of the fighter escort could have gone to your aid, but they didn't. Then the Admiral, and it, they, they talk about it on the tape, but it's kind of given short shrift, I'm afraid, where the admiral himself takes it on himself to launch a second strike. Is that, a, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And that strike, McNamara recalled, the admiral uh, basically jumped over his head as head of a task force. He had the authority to do that, as I understand. Correct. I'm talking to you. Then Lyndon Johnson himself said, he didn't give a damn about you guys. He didn't want his ally to be embarrassed. Is that correct? That's correct. That's, that's what, okay. I'd like to interject one thing. At this point in time, we didn't know who was attacking us. How in the world did he in Washington, five, 6,000 miles away, know who was right. attacking us? Right. If we didn't know, and we were the ones on the receiving end that day. Right. That's always been a little bit of a puzzlement. And it's on this video that the... Uh, nuclear armed planes were not headed to help you guys. They were headed for Cairo, apparently. That's what is implied there. And as such, could this, well, we're going to get into this as far as the actual motivation for this attack, but it looks like 
the motivation is starting to become very clear, doesn't it? And we'll we'll get into this probably in the second hour. We got the oh, we got a caller here. Let's go ahead with Bob. Go ahead, Bob. You got a question or comment? Uh, I'd just like to apologize for those fellows that were left out there. Uh, my question is. I wonder if this is an isolated event, or has the United States been doing this to our soldiers since day one? Well, not since the Revolutionary War, but at least since uh, the War for Southern Independence, they've done this. The uh, the events that are going on all over the world now, the most recent ones in my lifetime, the government has abandoned first the uh, the folks from the Vietnam War that were suffering from Agent Orange exposure, the government tried to minimize that. The government has minimized the agent uh, exposure, various kinds of agent exposure in the first Iraq attack. And, you know, these things are happening again in the second Iraq attack, due primarily to the use of nuclear weapons in Iraq. A couple more questions. This is Robert McNamara. Is he still alive? Uh, yes, yes, he is. He's probably drawing a pension from us, isn't he? Oh, I'm sure he is. He's been uh, around for a long time in government. <laughs> He's had uh, various government jobs. Well-paid trader. A well-paid trader. Well, thank you. I would call him a trader. I mean, thank you. Right. I do, too. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Bye, bye. And the, Bob is the kind of people that... We welcome on the show primarily because they understand what's going on, and we're here to pass out information. For those that don't want to pay attention, that don't want to listen, that don't believe, well, for those that don't believe, we give you the same thing that I've said over the years, and that was prove us wrong. Unfortunately, uh, I've been right too many times about the stuff that I've talked about on this program, and I'm afraid this one here is one of the more solid cases for government uh, screw-up, especially after watching this video. The rest of this video, we're going to have to wait until the next hour to be sure we get all of the rest of the clips in. But, folks, you need to pay close attention to what's going on. And this is just an historical reference. We've got the men that lived this historical event, it's an event that should be in the history books, but has been relegated to a footnote in the back of the thickest history book. So it's basically buried. And as you see the rest of the clips that I've got for you tonight and then tomorrow night when you see the whole thing at the meeting, I think you'll understand that these men weren't at fault. Who then was at fault for what happened? Well... More importantly, who was at fault for the cover-up? Who was at fault for the cover-up of the Agent Orange exposure? Who was at fault for the cover-up of the depleted uranium exposures that are still going on to this day? Tom, can I add something of course. to what you Go said? Mm -hmm. uh, the Navy has a new class of ship. I won't try and name them because I forget the, exactly what they were called. One of them was going to be named Freedom. One of them was going to be named Liberty. I'll give you one guess what name got pulled. They decided the <laughs> yeah. Liberty name's not going to be used. Uh, it's a little bit of fuss raised over this, trying to get a ship named Liberty. But I would just imagine that name for the foreseeable future is dead in the United States Navy. Well, it's dead in the now, country as a whole. I don't fault the Navy, and I don't want any Navy personnel to think that because you're answerable to your masters or the, the politicians, which that's where our government set up. But I disagree with that. I think that there should be another ship named Liberty. Liberty is another word for freedom. That's all I had on that. Thank you. There's, a, there's another group of veterans that served during the so-called Cold War, which was anything but cold, it was the Cold War was an excuse for the military industrial congressional complex to make lots of money and garner lots of power from you the the willing participants of their uh, taxation scam and those were the nuclear war or the nuclear test veterans that sat on the decks of warships 
that were within sight of nuclear blasts that had their deck shoes melted because the decks were so hot from the blast. Oh, they were on the opposite side of the ship from the blast, though. But their deck shoes melted because their, the decks were so hot from the nuclear attack or from the nuclear blast. Those guys have been ignored. I have personally talked to some of them over the years. And if any are listening, there's a group of them here. And if any of them are listening, uh, it would be nice if you called in in the second hour and shared some of your experiences because it goes hand in glove with what happened here. Except for the fact that the perpetrator, the direct perpetrator in your case, was the U.S. government. And they have tried such interesting things as losing the records, uh, deleting the service on the specific nuclear target ships that these men were on so that there's no record. Oh, well, how can you have uh, liver cancer because of your service, uh, radiation damage, because you weren't exposed, according to your DD-214 file. You weren't exposed. Uh, tell me if this rings a bell to anybody out there. Can I add something on that? Yes, sir. That's yeah. like most of the Liberty uh, medals, for all the way from the Congressional Medal of Honor that uh, Skipper Captain William McGonagall received mm -hmm. to the Silver Stars, the Bronze, right. Purple Hearts, all these medals. I doubt rather seriously that there's one uh, DD-214 that will uh, reflect the fact that these medals were received uh, on board the USS Liberty. Yeah, we're going to have something on that in the on this clip. Let me see if we got, uh, we got Russell. Go ahead, Russell. How you doing, buddy? All right, sir. Look, um, I'm just seeing what's going on. My father was in Vietnam. They wouldn't even give him a 21 gun salute. Mm hmm. When he died? Yeah, when he died. I called him up in the military. Wouldn't even give him that. Yeah. Um, this has been a big problem in recent years, too. It's caused quite a controversy that, uh, the military funerals that were promised to veterans have been eh, forgotten about. They claim, the claim is they don't have enough people to go out and do it. They don't have enough uh, honor guard personnel, etc., etc. Well, no, they're all out fighting some unconstitutional war someplace else in the world. They're not here. And I can sympathize with you, Russell, on that because... This is one thing that the families never forget. They never forget the military funeral of their loved one. And let's face it, they are due some honor. And I... Uh, did they give you a flag? Yeah, they gave me a flag. They gave you a flag. Okay, that's something anyway. But they said, uh, wait 48 hours, call us 48 hours before you um, pass away or something like that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's uh, convenient. All right, thank you, Russell. Thank you very much. See, it's the little things like that, folks. If they can't get the little things right, and that's minor, that's, that's not anything that uh, costs a lot of money, a lot of effort, then how do we expect them to get the big things right? Well, Katrina rings a bell there about big things happening. Since last we had these gentlemen on, there's been a lot going on that the government has messed up. The... Uh, Individual, you were telling me the it was Lloyd Painter, correct? Was it his testimony about machine gunning the life rafts? Well, you, Lloyd was in the tape there just a minute ago, and I'd like to give you just a little background on Lloyd. Okay, uh, quickly, we're we're running okay. low on time this time. All right. No, nope, we got thirty seconds. Okay. Okay. When we come back, we'll talk a little more about Lloyd Painter, and also we'll have the Israeli reaction on one of these tapes to the. Uh, allegation of machine gunning of the life rafts. Now remember what he said though, there weren't any troops in the life rafts, but they wouldn't have known that. Very good, very good. That's the problem with this, this break. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jim Reshore from Good World Industries, and I have with me today Joel Vanison. How you doing, Joel? Great, how are you, Jim? I'm wonderful. Now, Joe, tell the people a little bit about Goodwill and the locations that we have the stores. Sure, we have six um, retail stores in our Goodwill of Acadiana. We have one on Ambassador Caffrey, one on Johnson Street. We have one in Scott, Opelousas, Broussard, and New Iberia. So, 
they can go anywhere, and they all have pretty much have the same things. Yes, they all they all have the same pricing on all of our clothing items, um, and uh, you know there's there, depending upon the furniture that we have, there are different prices on that as well. Yeah. Uh, most, most, the only sort of really handle furniture is one in Scotland, correct? We do have some furniture at all of our locations, but predominantly our furniture is handled in our Scott location just because we have more space there. Okay, and uh, if uh, people want to make a donation, they, they can go to the store and make a donation? That's correct. Donations can be made at all six of our retail locations, as well as we have five what we call attended donation centers throughout Acadiana. Oh, great. And they're located all throughout the area, correct? Correct. What kind of hours do you have? Our stores are open 9 to 6, Monday through Saturday, and on Sunday we're open from 1 to 5. Okay, so it's just like a regular store then. Absolutely. Joel, do you see a lot of repeat customers coming back? Absolutely. We have a lot of loyal customers, and we really appreciate our customers as well as our donors because without both of them, we would not be able to generate the funds which provide the services we have throughout yeah. Acadiana. And very few people realize what kind of services we do have. Do you want to touch a little bit on that? Sure. Our, some of our services include job placement, job coaching. We have substance abuse. We have drug abuse counselors. We also have um, many youth programs as well as we provide housing. So it's the, yeah. the funds that are generated in the stores that fund all of these programs. Yeah, I was uh, at the housing for the elderly uh, just uh, this past week. Uh, one of my volunteers went to call bingo numbers. An old lady <laughs> loved playing bingo every day from 1 to 3. So they can go out and join them if you, if you care to join them play bingo. Please go out and join them. But again, uh, Joel, uh, what else is there about Goodwill? Goodwill, we've got great prices, great everyday low prices on, on slightly used items. Um, come and explore one of our stores and, and help us provide services that are needed here in Acadiana. We do have on occasion extra sales that we have, and those are posted on our website. Our website is www.lagoodwill.com. And something to go along with the stores, we do fundraising, and uh, I have Cajun Comic Group in January. We just had a very successful event. Uh, we had the Rag Top Rider, which is just finished. We're doing a fundraiser with Celebrity Theaters uh, in a couple of weeks in May, and then uh, we have another Rag Top Rider scheduled for October. And then Cajun Comic Group will be on Saturday, March 3rd next year, so the dates change. But John Morgan's coming back. Thank you, and have a good day. Only on public access. <laughs> this is Acadiana Open Channel. Cable Channel 19 and 5. Father, give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to do your will in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the break, Ken was reminding me that the USS Pueblo was the sister ship to the Liberty. The Pueblo was seized by North Koreans. What, what year was that? Uh, January, of, January of 68, I think. About a year later. It was now, I think, or six nine, months. Nine, eight or nine months thereafter. Yeah. Yeah. And much with the same result. The uh, Pueblo crew and their crew, were, were, and her crew, were left to languish in uh, North Korean hands for quite a, some time. They were there for 11 months. Uh, as far as it goes before the North Vietnam, uh, North Koreans uh, let them go. And the killing thing to me to this day, the Pueblo is sitting in the uh, harbor there in North Korea. They still have our ship. It's a, mm -hmm. you might say, a tourist attraction yeah. for them. Well, it's a souvenir. It's a trophy. Right. One that we need to blow the hell up. Yeah. Bob, go ahead.
Yeah, uh, I was wondering, uh, these gentlemen, have they filed a lawsuit against Israel? Because what Israel did, since they did not declare it uh, an act of war, it would be a criminal act, which would also would have civil consequences. Or negligence, right, and it had civil consequences. Well, Israel has no money, but what we send them, <laughs> couldn't they put a hold on whatever money that we're going to send Israel? I'd rather see it go to our soldiers than them people. Well, the... Uh, the organization has, as, as Gary mentioned in the last hour, has filed charges against them in the international court. But there again, uh, these are under the, the same uh, statutes, the same thing they used at the Nuremberg trials against war criminals from the Second World War and since then. But nothing has happened. That's been almost a year to the day. Yeah, Tomorrow that it was filed and the Navy is, set, is dragging their feet on it. They won't do anything. Yeah, but, but Israel didn't right. declare it as an act of war, what did right, they? Right, right. Well, then if they didn't declare it as an act of war, it seems like with all the smart attorneys we have that are so so crazy, it seems like they would help these guys out. Let, let, me, let me break in. We were uh, approached, I can't remember exactly how it went, but we were compensated from the government of Israel uh, a, a small amount. I want to say I, I might have received $200. I don't really remember the amount. <laughs> But we were compensated, or supposed to have been compensated from the Israel government. I really don't think that the government of Israel actually sent money to the United States. I think the United States paid the small compensation. But uh, we were compensated, and, and I, I can remember signing something and releasing them of the liability. Mm -hmm. well, I, what if you were compensated and they did something wrong? Well, that, this is... It would, it, would, it would appear to be. But we were comp I was compensated. What? $200? Uh, I remember, I think I got $200, yes. <laughs> Yeah, we had some guys that got 250 I also got $200. The Department of State, or State Department, sent letters. I still actually have my old letters uh, saying they had filed a claim on our behalf. Well, at the time I had just gotten out of the Navy, I didn't have two nickels to rub together, and that sounded good to me. He said, if you'll sign this, we'll send you a check. Well, needless to say, I signed it, and they sent me $200. Sounds like the government's in cahoots with the enemy. Well, it, uh, in my opinion, I have had attorney. I have had an attorney tell me that um, that <laughs> I, <laughs> go ahead. I've had an attorney tell me that you know that um, there was grounds for a suit, but what we're after is not a monetary gain. What we're after is justice, mm -hmm. plain and simple. They can take their money and stick it where the sun don't shine, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but I mean, I'd rather see you fellas get all them billions we're sending them than the Israel, as far as I'm uh, concerned. I understand that, and I appreciate your thought as uh, far as that goes, but this is not about trying to uh, extract monetary gain uh, from anyone. And, and you're going to see in the clips that we've got left the Israeli attitude about this incident. Their attitude is one of, oh yeah, we made some mistakes, but that's all it was, was mistakes. And of course, the other side of the coin is the evidence that is presented here tonight, plus what I don't show you tonight, but is on this tape, it's, there's some other stuff that's less striking that's on here, points to this being an intentional attack. Well, I have a real problem with them shooting at the lifeboats. I mean, that's... Well, I mean, I have yeah, a serious problem. Right, right. We do, too. That. And this is something we're going to talk about in more detail, but while you bring it up, go ahead and tell them a little bit about Lloyd Painter. He's the, the, he was an officer at the time. He's the one that, that you saw on the tape talking about machine gunning of the life rafts. Well, I, I would like to say something about Lloyd first. First off, he was an officer in the Navy. Lloyd was a straight-up good guy. He still is. He's an outstanding fellow. Uh, Lloyd, after he got out of the service, uh, he had a few years. I'm not sure what he did, but at a given point in time shortly after the service, Lloyd went to work for the Secret Service, and he spent 24 years in that profession, uh, up to guarding some presidential candidates. Uh, Lloyd is now retired, but Lloyd testified to the fact in the original Naval Court of Inquiry that, as it just showed in the tape a few moments ago, uh, when he went topside that Israel was firing on these life rafts. Now, 
his testimony was stricken from the original Naval Court of Inquiry. Uh, the reason I mention this, uh, I feel this is important, Captain Ward Boston, one of the two convening officers or two of the officers there that, that done the inquiry, Admiral Isaac Kidd and Captain Ward Boston, Boston signed an extended sworn uh, affidavit stating uh, that this was in the original Naval Court of Inquiry, but it is no longer there. So if it's no longer there, somebody excised it out. Who did it? Other than our own government in promoting this cover-up. Um, mm -hmm. And we also have corroborating witness uh, other than Mr. Lloyd Painter, uh, uh, a fellow crewman named Glenn Oliphant, uh, observed this from a different angle. The the firing on the life rafts. I know this is a horrible, terrible thing. <laughs> that in and of itself const constitutes a war crime. Oh yeah. Well, it's it's uh, obstruction of justice, conspiracy. There's all kinds of things you can call this by eliminating something from the official record they are guilty of all manner of criminal acts and of course nobody's going to be held accountable for it in this lifetime anyway the good lord will have something to say about it though well i'm just going to sit back and listen to what the rest of you have to say and wish the fellas good luck bye bye thank you bob go ahead joe hey how you doing hi hey, listen I'm, I'm not calling i, I don't mean to if i do sound uh, criticizing, or I, I don't, my phone call is not to mean uh, to be critical or to criticize or to slander, but to reason. Uh, they mentioned the caller that uh, was talking to you before mentioned that uh, we are, we're aiding the enemy. Now all of a sudden, Israel's our enemy. Uh, I, I heard a gentleman talk about the president, President Johnson, declaring he didn't care if the boat sank. Well, that sounds to me like you know, not should we be upset with Israel, but it sounds like we should be uh, have a little problem with our own government right, right. who didn't allow help to come to these men uh, in, in their time of need. And I think it may have sounds to me like it was a plot between America and Israel right. to blow up Egypt. Well, it was, and that's what so, uh, the rest of the clips that we're going to show tonight kind of narrows it down to that being the final... At last year at this time we didn't have some of this information and now this has come out there was an operation called uh, cyanide that there's actually a book out on it now it's called operation cyanide isn't correct it? by peter okay. hoonan by peter hoonan yes he's an englishman living in scotland at the moment and the thing the thing is it looks like this operation cyanide was behind this whole operation to have an excuse to take Egypt out of the picture completely. Well, again, you know, what's what's going on and what we see taking place is, is our, our, our sons, our daughters, you know, these two that are on the program with you, they seem to be expendable. Uh, our, yeah. our, our sons, our daughters, our, our government, these, these politicians, these higher up, these wealthy people, they just don't seem to give a, a rat's behind about, about human life that that uh, we keep sinning to, so say, bring democracy to the world, but we keep seeing uh, activity and actions of our own government that that do things like this and, and allow it to go on. And it seems to me they keep trying to hide and cover up the facts. And, and any time you, 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 uh, you tell the truth or you're honest or you're loyal, in some kind of way, they seem to make you seem to be a whack, or you're, you're, uh, you know, you have a, some kind of conflict of interest or something. So I, I just, to me, you know, I keep hearing uh, the, the, with the programs, with uh, Dr. Talawi's program, people turning against Israel, and it, it's what we, I think, what we're, we we need to realize is it's not not so much as, as the, the Hebrew or the Israeli people. It's like it's not so much the American people. It's these people who we put in, in authority and we put in power that well, keep doing this. Wait, Joel. I, I disagree with you on who's at, to, at fault. The American people are the ones that are ultimately at fault because they're allowing these people right. to be in office. Now, if enough people voted against certain politicians, even with the vote scams that are rampant now, Aside from the fact that the Colombian company has bought a voting machine company in this country, 
and the same Colombian voting machine company are the ones that put Chavez back into office, okay? Aside from that, voting has been controlled in this country for a long time. If not any other way but through the news media, the American people are still at fault for allowing it to get to this point and for facilitating this by even participating in the voting process. Well, for looking the other way, and I understand, right. I understand the reason, yeah. Where you, you We're trying to get the information out from the eyewitnesses, and you're going to see some more of this on the tapes from the actual government officials. You're going to see the cover-up at work. Well, I, I heard... To this day, when it's happened uh, 39 years ago, why are they even bothering to cover it up? Why not just right. come out and admit, well, yeah, we did it, so what? Well, the secrecy, well, the secrecy act, all this stuff to stay, to stay secret, the top secret, it, it's, it's after 40 years. See, this stuff is all now uh, allowed to come out. We're seeing a lot of stuff because I know my father, my father was in Korea. My grandfather was in World War II. And they, they told me about these things that, that the, 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 the leaders and how men were killed for, for no other reason that they were expendable. So it's like, it's time for us to say enough already with thinking that human life is expendable. I don't give a crap. I don't care whose life it is. I don't care if, if you're Israeli, you're Arab, you're, you know, what, what Mexican, you know, Life is not expendable, and we have to stop with this attitude that life is expendable, whether you're, you're rich or you're poor or whatever. But I think it's our attitude, our, it's, our, it's our blind attitude that we think that people are expendable, and I think we have to, we have to get a, a, a grip on that. We have to get control of that with our own way of thinking, and, and that's my, all my point I'm trying to make is to stop always thinking that we are expendable, and our sons and our daughters are expendable, and they don't mean nothing but, but what? I mean, what does all this mean? You know, people are dying, but all, all they can talk about is, is you know, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's just... It, Joel, it's beyond just our own lives, too, though, from the standpoint, I know people that want to exterminate all Muslims just because of a few. Well, okay. What kind of sense yeah. does that make? Okay. Yeah, it's just... You call yourself a Christian if you want to exterminate a whole race of people or a whole, whole grouping of people or a whole religiosity of people just because you don't happen to agree with their, their moolahs or a few of them happen to do certain things, which the official line is somewhat doubtful evidence-wise too. So the American people are deserving of whatever... Uh, hard times fall upon them. Well, I, well, well, Tom, we 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 know it's it's not that it's coming, Tom. We already know it's here. Well, we have the World Health Organization is already. Uh, we're not, not going to get into that, Joe. All right, this, this, all right. This is enough. On we're going to get on to the tapes now. But I all appreciate right. your comments because they're well taken. Uh, I thank you for allowing me to speak, sir. All righty. All right. Let's go ahead with the the tape. And uh, let's see, this next one is on the evidence and the excuses for what happened. So let's go ahead and roll that. But the cover up is about to begin. At four o'clock, the American naval attache in Tel Aviv heard from the defense ministry that a ship had been attacked in error. The American Embassy immediately reported back to the State Department in Washington. Yeah, I was the first one who got the word. And uh, I, my immediate reaction was it could not have been an accident. Shortly before 10 in the morning, Washington time, the news was passed on to President Johnson. He was rather inclined to agree with my view was that it had to have been uh, an intended attack. Johnson's belief that the attack was deliberate is preserved in the minutes of a White House meeting the following day. Also present was the CIA director, Richard Helms. And I know that uh, for the first 24 hours, the president was furious that uh, something like this had gone on. Whatever Johnson's inner circle thought privately, officially they accepted Israel's apologies and its explanation. Everybody seemed to be a little appalled at the Israelis. But this was not reflected in the public positions that the collective group had uh, outside that room. 
and I think we were overprotective of the Israelis at that point. I think the feeling was that uh, the pressure, political pressure, would be too much, and they were just going to let it go. That and thought it maybe would just go away. As a matter of fact, he said to me, standing in the cabinet room one day, have you looked at the New York Times? The attack on that American ship is on page 29, when it should have been on the front page. And then I guess various people got at him and so forth, and he changed his mind. But uh, or I don't think he changed his mind, he just changed his actions. President Johnson's public stance allowed Israel also to cover up the attack. Israel has always maintained that it was a series of mistakes. None of the former fighter pilots would agree to speak, but one of the torpedo boat sailors gave us his account. Uh, we were inexperienced at the time. We were uh, probably uh, a little trigger happy, and it was a war zone. Uh, no one should have been there, and anybody who is there is doing it at his own risk. Israel admits the reconnaissance planes had identified the Liberty during the morning. The Air Force notified Naval HQ in Haifa, where the ship's position was marked on a combat information map. Later that morning, Navy HQ received reports of the Sinai coast being shelled from the sea. But by this time, say the Israelis, the Liberty had been erased from their naval map. When the patrol boats went to find the source of the alleged shelling, the only ship they found there was the Liberty. Then the patrol boats misread the mystery ship's speed on their radar. They thought it was making 28 knots, so it could only be an enemy warship. The way you do it is by taking the uh, direction and distance from the radar to the, the target on the radar screen. And uh, if you do it for a short period, for just several minutes, the uh, differences in the speed can be fantastic. Anything between uh, uh, going backwards and, and, and 30 knots forward. So that's a very normal mistake. And so the Air Force was summoned to catch the fast-moving target. Then, says Israel, the sailors made another fatal mistake, confusing the ship with the El Kuzair, an Egyptian transport vessel half the Liberty's size. It looked very similar to, to the Al Qaeda. There were some differences, and again, you have to remember that she was already she had already been fired upon by the uh, by the airplanes. This was when word of the attack first reached the head of the navy, who happened to be Udi Arel's father. He'd been at Haifa Harbor, out of radio contact, and had just got back to Navy HQ. Of course, I was furious. The minute she was torpedoed, and it was clear to me, actually, that she, well, she couldn't have made 28 knots. And so I actually immediately ordered uh, definite identification. And then he reported that the flag was going up, was being hoisted, and uh, that his first identification was Soviet. I said, oh, my God. Come closer, he came closer and he identified her as an uh, American ship. Whatever the ship's identity, the Israelis vehemently deny that they'd ever fire at life rafts in the water. I don't believe it. I never saw such a thing. Uh, there was nothing was even resembling a life raft. Uh, and, and we certainly didn't shoot at it. We are taking part of the blame but only part of the plane. We made most of the mistakes. They made many mistakes on the spot and by the fact that the, that the, the liberty should not have been there. But the evidence points to Israel knowing the ship's identity and wanting it sunk fast. This U.S. Air Force intelligence analyst was following radio intercepts of the attack. His work was top secret so his identity is disguised. I've been living with the thought of what happened for a long time. Uh, eventually, over the years, uh, I tried to put it out of my mind. I felt that it was important that I indicate what I feel is the truth, that this was an intentional attack on this ship. They knew they were attacking an American ship. 
And the other thing that uh, came through very clear throughout the day and through the transcripts that I read was the, the imperative insistence that this uh, target be removed in totality and quickly. And when that did not happen, there was uh, 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 transmissions very indicative of frustration from the ground side uh, trying to sink this target and everybody with it immediately. The inescapable conclusion is that Israel wanted no one left to tell the tale. beginning of the last hour, Ken had mentioned seeing the overflight by Cessna Piper Cub type aircraft. I'd like him to repeat that again, what you had mentioned at the beginning of the first hour. I'm going to make a point about that and what you just saw. When I was outside, uh, I remember seeing a small type <coughs> aircraft flying uh, not directly over us, but out in the distance, a little ways from the ship, at, at the speed that they normally go. Of course, you know, it, it never really dawned to me anything was going on uh, until uh, later in the day when, when the actual jet uh, shot at us. But okay. I do remember seeing some type of aircraft like that. Okay, and the, the Liberty was in U.S. Naval Gray, right? Correct. Hold, hold. Right was named on the bow, on the stern rather, and numbered on the bow with the great big number, right. five. GTR was, GTR. Uh, that number was five <laughs> or six feet tall, five, that number was uh, more like ten feet tall and okay. bright okay. white. And the ship that they claimed that it looked like, the El Khazir, tell us a little more about that. This tape is not that detailed on what the El Khazir was, even where it was. But Gary knows where it was at the time. Well, the El Khazir, now I want you to stop and think about this, was 195 feet shorter than us, approximately two-thirds the length of a football field. It weighed 2,400 tons loaded, 2,400 tons. The USS Liberty weighed 10,600. Uh, we were over 8,000 tons, 8,200 tons heavier than the El Quasir. We were four times larger, uh, roughly 200 feet, 195 feet longer, uh, with a weird uh, an uh, collection of antennas. It would be virtually impossible to mistake these two ships for a trained naval personnel. Uh, or any trained observer I believe would have been in those aircraft that were orbiting around the the, uh, the ship. Correct. I think a 12-year-old sea cadet could have told you what it was. Uh, and here you're talking about one of the best trained militaries in the world. Uh, the only two intelligence gathering apparatuses that were greater and, and more efficient then and now than theirs was the Americans and the Soviets. Israel was number three. There's no way that they didn't know who we were. Uh, by their own admission, at one point in time, at 10.55 a.m. Tel Aviv time, the Liberty was in, on one of their war room charts. They had uh, mm -hmm. ID'd the ship to uh, a British publication called Jane's Fighting Ships that lists virtually every ship from every nation that's on the high seas. Uh, they knew who we were, where we were at, but they knew who and where we were at way before we got there. They had us on their shore radar uh, the night of the 7th and the morning of the 8th. Uh, and during the attack, the planes, their radar was locked on us. There's a, never any doubt by these people who we were. Mm -hmm. That's a joke from, and not a joke, it's just a damn lie for them to say that they didn't know. Well, that torpedo boat skipper that claims <coughs> there was nothing in the water resembling life rafts, uh, how many rafts would you estimate had been kicked over the side because they were damaged or burned. There was supposed to have been three as the official number, uh, as the accepted number. Uh, in this dead in the water tape, if somebody looked close and knew where to look, these life rafts were on uh, 
uh, carriers on the, on the main deck. We all had uh, life raft stations that we went to and when we had abandoned ship drills, and, and, and Ken could back me up on that. Um, you had 12, 15 men to each life raft. Uh, most of these life rafts were shot up or burnt or damaged, but there were some that were put over the side, and they were shot up. And there's something I would like to... I would like to add to that if I may. After the torpedo hit us and some of the official pictures and stuff, the starboard side of our ship, uh, in the area of the below the superstructure, which below the superstructure would be the engineering spaces where I was at, we were hammered mercilessly from these uh, motor torpedo boats. Uh, with all the, uh, the different types of ordnance they had. Now, they had to have some armor-piercing rounds uh, because they were some that came through the hull of the ship. And I can remember hearing the strange noises while we're dead in the water. I didn't know what the noise was at the time. Later on, I learned that it, it was uh, these APs bouncing off the steel lines and stuff down there and, and the different uh, equipment that we had. And, it didn't end when the torpedo hit us. They still came in point blank, close range, and hammered the hell out of us. Okay. We were flying a U.S. flag. I oh, want to add that. We hadn't even mentioned that, but flags are easy to come by. The, the Egyptians could have been flying a, an American flag to, uh, to throw the Israelis off, right? But I, what I suspect is that that uh, torpedo boat officer had the same optometrist as the pilot's. They're all wearing the same set of uh, corrective lenses. Bob, go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah, just one more question. Y'all were in international waters, right? That is correct. We were 12.5 nautical miles off the Sinai. Uh, the closest uh, hamlet or town was El Arish. Because he said y'all were in a war zone. Well, we were in international waters. We were an American ship flying the U.S. flag, or ensign as we call it. It was flying from the mast. Um, uh, it was not a recognized war zone, I guess you could say, by us. Yeah. And, it's international waters, and, and, again, you're not a, and you're not a combatant in a war. Ergo, one is a, uh, a neutral, is not to be touched. International waters, I mean, I don't know if you can, de unless you declare a total world war. Right. <laughs> I mean. Exactly. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tom. Thanks, Bob. All right. You're going to see that, uh, I think I got it on there, about the Air Force participation in all of this. That's right, U.S. Air Force. We're going to see that in a second. Got the other tape ready? The, the, the thing to remember about all this stuff is keep an open mind. In other words, the government of Israel and the government of the United States comments about this all make sense if you don't think about it. Okay. Let's roll this next clip on the cover-up. An unarmed American ship had been attacked by Israeli planes and boats. Thirty-four sailors were dead, and the U.S. had done nothing to help. For the first time in 35 years, we can explain why. The theory has cast light on the tangled web of American-Israeli relations. Some people suspect the ship might have been overhearing information on Israeli operations in the Sinai. I think they intended to attack the ship. Exactly why they wanted to, they, I'm not sure. They may have felt we were, with, that, with the liberty, we were listening in to some conversations and other things that were going on that they didn't want us to know about. And uh, they, they had been engaged in some pretty outlandish stuff in the course of the war. I didn't think they wanted us to know all the detail of that. I don't think that we would have cared. America was not an enemy. There was nothing they could uh, in any way involve us, threaten us, concern us. No. I don't even know what were the tasks of the liberty. What really, what the purpose to find out where how the war was going on, I don't know.
But there's a broader theory, that the attack was intended to be blamed on Egypt and would therefore draw America into the war and was carried out with the foreknowledge of certain people in Washington. The Liberty's captain had always suspected this was the case. In 1997, at Arlington Cemetery, he broke his 30-year silence. For many years, I had wanted to believe that the attack on the Liberty was pure error. It appears to me that it was not a pure case of mistaken identity. I think that it's about time that the state of Israel and the United States government provide the crew members of the Liberty and the rest of the American people the facts of what happened and why it came about that the Liberty was attacked 30 years ago today. Less than two years later, McGonagall himself would be buried at Arlington. Shortly before he died, he sent an open letter to President Clinton calling for Israel to acknowledge publicly that her armed forces had deliberately attacked the USS Liberty. Captain McGonagall was more than just a captain in the Navy. He was a friend. He was a sailor's captain. Towards the end of his life, McGonagall confided in his old friend, the chief engineer. Captain and I was, was, was real close, and um, every time I'd see him while he was in the hospital, uh, he would cry, and, and uh, he called me a few years, two or three years before he died. Uh, he was going to be in Washington for me to come up there, and I sat in the room with him. We chatted a while, and then he got started telling me that those SOBs really did us in, George. And I said, what are you talking about? McGonagall went on to say that if the Liberty had been sunk with all hands, the blame would naturally fall on Egypt and her Soviet backer. We were guinea pigs to be sunk, and then we could say Egypt and Russia did it. That way the United States could have stepped right in and helped Israel. We found evidence that this was part of a larger plan hatched by Israeli and American intelligence to invade Egypt and overthrow Nasser, a plan codenamed Cyanide. A key figure was James Angleton, Israel's closest friend in the CIA and unique beneficiary of a memorial from Mossad. Jim Ennis first came across Cyanide almost by chance. I had gone to the LBJ library asking for, you know, all Liberty documents, and this one-page paper came out of nowhere. Minutes from the 303 committee. The 303 committee was a secret group that used to meet at the old executive office building around the corner from the White House. 303 committee was simply a device for examining covert operations of any kind and making a judgment on behalf of the president so he wouldn't be nailed with the thing if it failed. Here, in April 1967, the committee met to discuss a sensitive Defense Department project. It would involve the Liberty with a highly risky submarine operation to help Israel. Scribbled on the minutes is a note, submarine within UAR waters, another term for Egypt. Especially the fact that this was in the Liberty file uh, suggested that this had to do with uh, with the submarine that was near us and uh, with cyanide and all the other things. Dave Lewis had also heard about cyanide. One of his officers had told him the ship was carrying secret documents in connection with a submarine project. He said there are sealed orders in my safe for Project Cyanide that involves communication via submarine in case of war. That that's all I know about it. The orders were never open. The attack took place. There wasn't time. I don't know what they said. 
What connection could this mysterious submarine have had with the Liberty? And why was it being discussed a full two months in advance of the war? The operation is still so sensitive that we could get no comment from U.S. or Israeli intelligence. Operation Sinai. If I heard about it, if I heard so... What was it? Um... I suggest we stop the interview here. What do you say? Why you want it? Why would you not be able to speak about Operation Cyanide? It's 34 years since. <clears throat> Signature and loyalty to my country. Is it very sensitive? I am built so, and I know exactly what I am able to tell you, and I know exactly where I stop. And here I stop. We were strategic and tactical reconnaissance photo processing specialists. We flew probably eight missions that day, all bomb damage assessment, all airports in disarray lines of aircraft destroyed in place from what we saw in that film it was unchallengeable um, destruction of the enemy this covert operation was also part of cyanide before the war the team had secretly been sent to an Israeli air base in the Negev desert the men wore unmarked uniforms and had no ID while four American reconnaissance planes were disguised as Israeli. There was a hurry-up paint job uh, done to the aircraft to identify them as Israeli aircraft so that, that they would be in conformance with normal Israeli, uh, normal Israeli markings. No, not one single word of it is true. I don't know what, it is the man, uh, I don't know what. Fantasy, it's a fantasy, he's dreaming, he's making it up. Nothing. Um, they can deny it now. Fine. <laughs> Take a look at the reconnaissance information that the Israelis have that was published publicly in Time magazine, Life magazine, I think Look magazine. That was our work. The Israelis had no reconnaissance aircraft and you can't get the detail off of gun cameras that, that was in those films. If it's true that America was secretly in the war against Egypt, this had to be kept quiet at all costs. Well, the implication would be very serious. I mean, first of all, it means that, that, that LBJ and his uh, people around him had been lying to us uh, through their teeth. Um, and that may be a minor matter for most people, but be important to us. Uh, but more important, it would mean a, a, uh, an American uh, participation in the attack on, on uh, Egypt, a very serious thing for us to have done. And it would have, uh, you know, uh, finished our relations with the, with the Arab world for a long time to come. As it was, six Arab states broke relations with us. Israeli officials you saw there, Aitan and Gazit, were definitely not forthcoming any longer with their comments. When we started getting into the strategic agreements and the U.S. participation in the Six-Day War, they suddenly clammed up, didn't they? It was very interesting that they would talk before that about accidentally almost sinking the liberty, but then when they got down to the nitty-gritty as to why, well... You saw the results. And, of course, the, the 303 committee, the involvement of the submarine, and uh, Gary told me that uh, he has run into somebody that was possibly on that submarine. I'll let him tell you about it. Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, 
I'll talk about the submarine. It's something I also would like to mention that was in the tape, the Operation Cyanide. Um, here recently, I won't call the individual's name because even the crew doesn't know the name, only a couple of the crewmen. One of our men, one of our crewmen, had an individual from a sub that was in operating in that area, and they, for most of their stuff, as he informed me, was special operations. Uh, he tells me they were there that day. Um, I was supposed to have a sit down or a face to face with him. Uh, three or four things have happened. We we've, we've never gotten together as yet. Um, our government denies that there was a sub there. He tells me he pointed out to me some pictures. He said uh, these are these photographs are. are I forget the term he used, but it was a, a particular type photograph that would have been taken through a periscope on a sub. He said these, these didn't come from a surface vessel, which I was not aware of, one of the things that he had pointed out. Um, this is another area we're looking at. Of course, we've looked at it for years. We've, we've had people off this sub come forward before and say, yes, they were there. The skipper of this particular sub says, no, we weren't there. But you have to understand the silent service, uh, the submariners, they're not going to talk a whole lot. But something I would like to go back to and mention, uh, something Jim Ennis found in the Johnson Library, this Operation Cyanide, something that was just shown on this clip with this Rafa Eton uh, in Operation Cyanide. All right, that Operation Cyanide's here. Johnson's Library. This is an American operation and American Israeli operation. I believe American Israeli operation. Uh, for the way that Etan responded to that, why do you want to know this? Uh, and he's not answering the question and he's signing off to it, tells me that there was some secret operation going on. We have partitioned probably every branch of government through the Freedom of Information Act trying to garner and get information in regard to Operation Cyanide only to be blackballed, stonewalled, or sending stuff that's totally redacted, blacked out, you can see nothing. Uh, there was two operations we feel in place that day. Frontlet 615 uh, was pointed out to me that 615 probably stood for six for June 15 for the 15th of the month. That was when this war probably was supposed to start. If you go back and look at what happened to the run-up to the Six-Day War, uh, Israel and Egypt had gotten on kind of a war footing as we occasionally see Pakistan and India do over Kashmir. Um, but the Egyptians were re withdrawing from the Sinai. They were backing down. Now they still were blocking the Straits of Tehran. Um, but I believe in a few days they would have been totally backed away from war, and Israel seized its chance um, to acquire a little more real estate. Okay. That's <clears throat> the, uh, before we get to the last tape, I want to mention, be sure we have time. They've, the organization has a website, USSLiberty.org, very simple one, USSLiberty.org. And you can get this tape on their website from them. This tape, again, is dead in the water. And, of course, remember, this is not the whole tape that you're seeing tonight. It is uh, not chopped up like, unfortunately, I had to do here so we could uh, have something for Gary and Ken while we were uh, discussing this whole thing. Because this is a very good tape. As I mentioned earlier, this is the best one that I've seen. There's been a, they've been on the History Channel, they've been on the Discovery Channel with these things, but never as detailed, never as in-depth as this one is. Now, this next one deals with the ultimate aftermath, as we've discussed a little bit on it, but how did the U.S. government, uh, it deals primarily how the U.S. government treat the individuals who were survivors of the unprovoked attack of the USS Liberty in international waters. Let's go ahead and roll that.
Ford was reviewed at the Navy's European headquarters by Merlin Starring, later the Navy's top lawyer. It didn't appear to support Kidd's conclusion that Israel had attacked him ever. Well, I, I, I simply could not find an evidentiary basis for that conclusion. I had considerable trouble with the record in attempting to, as I read through it, uh, attempting to find the evidence, the testimony, and or other evidence that would support some of the findings or opinions or conclusions that the Court of Inquiry had, uh, had drafted and had reached. Today, even after 35 years, the Liberty incident remains so sensitive that the U.S. Navy refuses to comment on it. I think there was a, a, a cover-up. I think there were details known from talking with some of those crews. It was pretty bad. How should my personal view be other than my American view, which was that... Uh, they intended to attack this ship, and there's no excuse that can be found for their saying that this was just a mistake. Most importantly, President Johnson, like Richard Helms, would also have been getting the radio intercepts. I would find it, I guess, difficult to believe that if uh, an analyst sitting where I was was receiving information uh, in, in a fairly uh, uh, prompt and, and real-time manner that somebody somewhere wasn't also transmitting the same information to other agencies, including the White House, uh, Pentagon, or else. You know, if you see items of this nature, you know, it should be directed to people in authority. Did Johnson order a cover-up? No, that I'm aware of. But people were sworn to secrecy? The naval inquiry is regarded by many as incomplete. You asked McNamara about those questions, I'm not going to answer those. I am not saying anything about the liberty, period. In Israel, it was soon business as usual. An inquiry attended by the Navy chief, Shlomo Arel, concluded that the attack was mainly due to a series of Israeli blunders. Despite this, nobody was charged or court-martialed. They didn't find anyone guilty of uh, uh, committing any, any crime or negligence or whatever. But this is... I don't want to, uh, to make apologies for that because it was outside my jurisdiction. After a month in Malta, the Liberty was patched up and ready to begin her journey home. It was pretty eerie because uh, we had to stand watches um, different uh, times down where the torpedo had hit. We had to check for leaks and you could smell the fuel oil and it was so airy you... You know, your shipmates were just down there, and you'd swear that they were talking to you. Talk about the attack and the threat of court-martial. Now the Navy scattered them, and no two were posted together. Even their medals were awarded secretively. I remember receiving my, my uh, Purple Heart in the captain's office in Bremerhaven, Germany, and with the, ad, with, the, with the warning, don't ever tell anyone where you got it. Don't ever. I knew at that time that things had gone terribly wrong with with what had happened to us. I knew something was up and so I basically made a decision to get out of the Navy and I, and I uh, did my uh, finished off my obligation, resigned my commission and left the Navy. Captain McGonagall was given America's highest award but with little ceremony. That's the only Congressional Medal of Honor that I'm familiar with that was not presented by the President of the United States. It's normal protocol for the President to present the CMH. 
was presented by the Secretary of the Navy at the Navy Yard, a little base down in southeast Washington, rather than at the White House by the President. Well, certainly, uh, I think it was uh, the, the way that the, the Navy and the White House handled this was a travesty. Uh, Johnson didn't want this thing publicized. Uh, he thought it would uh, uh, harm relations with Israel and his relations with, uh, with Jews in the United States. For liberty, as you were commanding officer at that time. For the officers and men of liberty, I accept this presidential unit citation, and I would add my own personal appreciation for their professional devotion to duty. Every one of our citations talks about military action, occasionally mentions enemy action, but never mentions that it was the state of Israel. For heroic achievement in connection with the unprovoked and unexpected armed attack on USS Liberty in the Eastern Mediterranean on 8th of June, 1967. A Silver Star Medal to Lieutenant George H. Golden. Three times were told to stand by for a torpedo attack. I witnessed a cover-up take place of the highest magnitude. I witnessed someone receiving the highest medal of the land, someone being promoted, someone given his choice of duty in the Navy for his silence. Nothing more, nothing less. And the, the silence paid off. The captain never stepped forward until the end of his life. And I only think what could have been if he'd have stepped forward in 1967. But a presidential election was coming up. Nobody in power wanted to let questions about the USS Liberty spoil relations with victorious Israel. I think it should have caused more of a problem than it did. It was, we went on in, in official reactions to each other and we renewed our old friendships could consider we really ignored it for all practical purposes and we shouldn't have it was a very bad thing alright I'm going to close out well, this will probably be our last comment. I'm going to use a letter from Joe Matters, a fellow crewman from Corpus Christi. I'm going to have to abbreviate it a little bit. But this is a letter that he uh, mailed to Honorable Harry Reid, Senator from the state of Nevada, June 5, 206. On here, it says, On June 3, 206, you were quoted in the Las Vegas Sun as being for the creation of an independent commission to investigate military atrocities in Iraq. Because the military can't investigate itself. Senator Reid, where is your outrage at the cover-up of the massacre of, the, of Americans on the USS Liberty? I also have to wonder, whose life, if we're going to try and put a value on a life, is an American's life worth less than an Iraqi or anybody else's is worth more? I would hope we would at least be equal. These were Americans that were murdered on board the USS Liberty. Thirty-one sailors, two Marines, one NSA civilian, 173 wounded. Uh, out of a crew of 294, we had a 70% casualty rate. Uh, why don't some of the politicians and quit being politicians and uh, with their partisan politics and their BS and look out for the American sons and daughters? Uh, I'm a little too old to serve now other than maybe... I'm not sure what I'd serve in now, a Salvation Army maybe, but uh, i got worlds of great nephews and nieces. I hate to see anything happen to any of them or any, anybody else's children. How can you ask our young people to serve today when you turn your back on them? I've got to thank Tom Parker and the Freedom Forum for having Ken and I here tonight. Uh, outstanding show, and I thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll have better news for you next year. We'll try and make this an annual event. Hello, I'm Jim Reshore from Goodwill Industries of Acadiana. I have with me today Faye Nunn from 